Wow, we're awake now. There's a lot of my mic in the monitors. Um, so uh, we're glad that you're here this morning. We are having a doozy of a morning. It's been, uh, everything's going a little bit crazy. We've had a lot of people uh, out of pocket on vacation. A lot of those people who make a lot of things happen on Sundays. And we know that the enemy's trying to attack, but we know that that means God is on the move this morning. And this morning we're going to join together in worship singing, Blessed Be Your Name, that we can worship God uh, even in the troubled times, even when everything's going great or when everything's going wrong, we can still worship God and praise His name. So let's stand together as we sing, Blessed Be Your Name. Sing this out. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Sing every blessing. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the day. so glad that you're here this morning, glad that you've joined us to worship, and that's exactly what we're going to do this morning. We're going to lift God's name high. It's not about anybody who's up here or anybody who speaks through these microphones, but it's all about the name of the Lord this morning. So we hope that you're uh, anxiously expecting God to move, because if you are, you're in for a treat today. If you're a guest here, we hope that you feel welcome, 
And if you're a member, we're glad to see you again. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll join each other in fellowship. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and for all your many blessings, God. We thank you for bringing us here together to worship you. God, be with us this morning uh, as we hear your word. Be with Ryan as he brings the message. God, fill him with your spirit, that it would be your words, not his. God, that everything he says would come straight from you. Uh, Lord, uh, help those who are uh, out of pocket this week, that you would bring them back safely at the end of the week and be with us today as we worship. And in your name I pray, amen. Greet each other in the name of the Lord this morning. Amen. As we make our way back to our seats, let's join together singing, I will sing of my Redeemer. Time out. <laughs> I think we have a bit of a mix up here. So, At least the one you know. <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, I see what you did. We could do that. We could do it that way. We're going to make that one work. Yeah, we can make that work. We're good. Let's do it.
seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I have a story to read and apparently it will fit right in because we need something to laugh about and we've already had some good laughs. <laughs> this is one of my very favorite authors, Robert Fulgram. He's a minister, he's a philosopher, he is a, just a down-to-earth person, sees the good, sees the bad, and anyway, this is a wonderful story. So, bear with me. Do you believe in God, Mr. Fulgram? The journalist interviewing me has shifted scale suddenly from the details of dailiness to the definition of the divine. No, but I do believe in Howard. Howard? You believe in Howard? It all has to do with my mother's maiden name. Your mother's maiden name? Was Howard. She came from a big Memphis clan that was pretty close and was referred to as the Howard family. As a small child, I thought of myself as a member of the Howard family. 
because it was often an item of conversation as in the Howard family is getting together. And the Howard family thinks people should write letters to their grandmother. The matriarch, my mother, my grandmother, was referred to as Mother Howard. And you thought she was God? No, no, I just wanted you to know first how it was that Howard was a name that was important to me from, the early, from early on in my life. What happened was that I got packed off to Sunday school at around the age of four. And the first thing I learned was the Lord's Prayer, which begins, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And what I heard was, Our Father, which art in heaven, Howard be thy name. And since little kids tend to mutter prayers, anyhow, nobody realized what I was saying. So I went right on believing that God's name was Howard and believing I was a member of his family, the Howards. Since I was told that my grandfather had died and gone to heaven, God and my grandfather got all mixed up in my mind as one and the same, which meant I had a pretty comfy notion about God. When I knelt beside my bed each night <clears throat> excuse me, and prayed, Our Father which art in heaven, Howard be thy name, I thought about my grandfather and what a big shot he was because, of course, the prayers ended with, For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I went to bed feeling pretty well connected to the universe for a long, long time. It was a Howard family enterprise. You're not putting me on, are you, she said. No, not at all. All human images of the ultimate ground of being are metaphors. And as metaphors go, this is a pretty homey one. And I thought it for so long that even when I passed through all those growing up stages of skepticism, disbelief, revision, and confusion, Somewhere in my mind, I still believed in Howard, because at the heart of that childhood image, there is no alienation. I belonged to the whole big scheme of things. I lived and worked and had my being in the family store. So do you still believe in Howard? I'll give you what may seem to be an egg, I got that word, enigmatic, shoot, <laughs> an enigmatic evasion but it's truly the only answer I have to your question. It's a line from the writings of a 13th century Christian mystic, Meister Eckhart. The eye, which, the eye with which I see God is the very same eye with which God sees me. That's what I believe. Does that mean that you are God? Well, yes and no. It depends. In some cultures, if a man says, I am God, he will get shunned or even locked up as crazy. In some other cultures, if a man says, I am God, people will say, well, what took you so long to find out? If you say you pray and talk to God, we will think of you as religious. If you say God talks to you, we will think of you as loony. I'm not sure I understand, she said. Consider it this way. It makes a big difference if you think of God as transcendent or imminent, as up there somewhere or present here. Yes. Well, Howard is transcendent, image of God, the God of childhood, the man in the long white beard of the throne on in, sitting on the throne in heaven up there somewhere else, separate from us, transcendent. On the other hand, if God is imminent, then there is no place God is not, and I am not separate from God. Hence, the eye with which I see God is the very same eye with which God sees me. No boundaries between God and me. There was a long silence between us. The journalist smiled. I smiled. She changed the subject. None of this discussion about Howard ever appeared in her article. I understand. Some things are just hard to write about, hard to think about, hard to sort out. Maybe when she asked the first question, I should have just said yes as a favor to her. But the truth is, I haven't finished thinking about God. And the God of my childhood and the God of my middle age are mixed in with the God of the wisdom that may yet come to me in my later years. Howard would understand. As we prepare to worship with our tithes and offerings, let's stand together and continue singing with Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great. 
Dear Father God, we're blessed in so many ways by being here today. Father, we're blessed by being able to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're blessed by the wonderful music that we're able to enjoy. Father, we're blessed by the message that you have given as we look forward to Ryan's preaching today. Father, we're blessed especially that we can be a part of the workings of your kingdom through our tithes and offerings. At this time, we ask your blessings on the gift and the giver, and we thank you for all the wonderful things that you provided for us through this church. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen.
prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. So I prophesied as I was commanded. As I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, conjure the four winds of the breath and breathe. Awake, awake, awake my soul. You know, all the time we read and we, we hear these stories um, of people experiencing different levels of grief. As when we hear stories of veterans who had to leave their best friends behind in the midst of war and the emotions that followed them. Or we hear about it when we turn on the TV and the news is on and we hear yet another family grieving because a drunk driver took the life of a loved one. Or when we read articles online about innocent people in other countries who are killed at the hands of terrorists or other extreme groups of violence. All of these stories can relate under one feeling, under one emotion, under one word, grief. And grief, according to the dictionary, can be defined as, number one, deep sorrow, usually caused by someone's death, or number two, trouble. And grief is emotion that we have all experienced in our lifetime. And we get stuck in the valleys of life, and it seems overwhelming. And we're surrounded by desolation and death with no end in sight. And the mountaintops seem too far away, and the journey is just too difficult to process. And we're surrounded by bones, the bones of the ones who have walked this journey before us and couldn't find the strength to make it out. Where do we go next? What happens after this? And, the, and as that question lingers in your mind, you start to remember all the times that you were feeling this grief. You remember all these times that you were surrounded by darkness. Who knows? You could be in the valley this morning. You could be feeling those same things this morning, and you could be in the place of desolation. But this morning, I want you to remember those times. I want you to reflect on them and think about it. Place yourself back in the valleys that you have been in. Did you really ever come out of it? Are you still feeling those same feelings of grief that you felt so long ago? They can go away this morning. You can be delivered. 
And honestly, this morning, I hope you came broken. I hope that you set yourself to the side and put all these distractions away and that you come this morning to know that Jesus Christ is Lord of all or he isn't Lord at all. And if you came here thinking that you're perfect, that you don't need saving, that, and that you can handle this life on your own, I promise you that you can't. Church isn't supposed to be a place where perfect people come. It's not a museum of greats. It's a hospital for the broken, and it's time to realize that we're the patients. Why we ever thought that we were just here for the sake of church is crazy. No. We are here to see the doctor this morning. So just as I said, please put your pride away. Come to the end of yourself and let God work. This morning we're going to be in the book of Ezekiel. We're going to be looking at chapter 37 of this book. And we're going to be studying verses 1 through 14. And Ezekiel's in the Old Testament. It's right after Lamentations and right before Daniel. So as you're turning there, Ezekiel is the author of this book and he is a prophet of God. And all 48 chapters of Ezekiel are prophecies. And Ezekiel's life was not easy. He lost his wife in Babylon in chapter 24, and his reputation was put on the line when he opposed false prophets among the exiles in chapter 13. And so many things were happening in Ezekiel's life that caused him to feel this grief. They were too hard for a mere man to bear on his back. And grief was knocking on his door. But let's look at chapter 37 real quick. And for right now, we're only going to go to verse 6. It says this. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold... There were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. Verse 3 says, And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Pray with me this morning. Father God, I just thank you so much for who you are, God. Uh, Thank you for filling our lungs with breath this morning, giving us uh, purpose for today. God, I pray, Lord, that you are just in this place. We invite you in, God. Your word says where two or more are gathered in your name, there you are also. So, Lord, we are claiming that promise this morning, Lord, and we just hope that you show up and show out in a mighty way like you usually do. Lord, I'm just so thankful for the scriptures that you have given us God, that we have something to turn to in times of grief, in times of sorrow, God, but we can also turn to them when we're happy and we're in the high places in life, God. Thank you so much for your enduring word. Lord, I just thank you for each person in here, God. I pray that you touch each and every single person in here from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, Lord, and wrap them up in your protection, your mercy, God, and heal these broken souls this morning. Lord, we have come to the doctor, to get the cure for life. And Lord, we are so thankful for what your son did 2,000 years ago on a cross, carrying my sins and carrying everyone's sins so that we may be forgiven and come back to you. Lord, I am so thankful for all that you've done in my life. God, I pray that, Lord, that you just continue to mold me and shape me into who you want me to be, Lord. Don't let, the, don't let these people see me let them see you. And it's your precious name I pray. Amen. So this morning, we are on the second part of this four-part series. Last week was giants. This morning, we'll be looking at grief, and we're going to study how Ezekiel overcame the grief in his life. 
So in the first six verses of the passage, we can see that God has taken Ezekiel into a valley that was full of bones. And in verse 1, we see that it says, The hand of the Lord was upon Ezekiel, which in Hebrew, the hand of translates to Yod, which means power or direction. So God's power was on Ezekiel. And it took him into the midst of a valley full of death, a, a valley that was full of lifeless beings with no hope. And as Ezekiel walks around in this desolate place, he notices how dry these bones were. These bones have been there for quite some time now. And because of that, they have become dry and brittle. But look at something with me, church. Let's think about this. Could it be you that might be in the same place this morning? Could you be stuck in the same place that Ezekiel was taken to this morning? And notice what God asks him in verse 3 of the passage. He asks him, Son of man, can these bones live? In essence, God was saying to Ezekiel, I want you to look at the condition of these bones. I want you to notice how dry these bones are, how long they've been sitting here, and how brittle that has made them. They've been waiting, they've been decaying, they've been crumbling. And so he says, so look at these bones and tell me if you see life. Tell me if you see hope for these bones in this valley. And there is absolutely no way that Ezekiel could see any of that. These bones were way beyond the sign of life. They were just the remains of those who came before him. They were trapped in the valley of pain, of grief, and they lost their battle to it. And many times in this life, people are going to look at you and they will say that you are too far gone, that you are too broken to have life again. And they will only be judging the condition of your life based off your past, based off the things that you used to do. But when God sees you, he only sees the potential of life. And he will challenge those around you to see it as well. See, it didn't matter what Ezekiel saw because Ezekiel, in essence, he was nothing. He was ordinary. But when God enters the scene in your life, he can't help but to see purpose. Because God is extraordinary. And it's time for you to stop listening to the lies that this world tells you, to the lies that people tell you, to the lies that you tell yourself. It may seem that you don't have any hope. It may seem that your life isn't amounting to much right now. It may seem that you are just surrounded by death, but God wants to speak truth over your life today and fill you with purpose. Ezekiel responded in the last part of verse 3 with this. O oh Lord God, you know. Ezekiel knew that there was nothing that he could do to make these bones live again. But he fully trusted in the power of God. And he knew that he was able to do anything. So here we have Ezekiel in the valley of dry bones with no hope. No life, nothing but grief. And as he walks around and passes by these bones, these skeletons, God asks him if there could be any life. And Ezekiel is like, God, only you know. And in verses 4 through 6, God responds to Ezekiel and he tells him, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. All right, this seems kind of crazy, don't you think? You know, Ezekiel is, is told to talk to a bunch of bones. 
He's told, he, he was brought here by the Lord, and he's just told Ezekiel, you gotta, you got to say to these bones everything I'm telling you. And then, and then after you do that, they will live again. They will breathe again. They will get up and walk again and move and be full of life. And when God tells us to do the same thing in our own life, how many times do we turn around and sulk in our own misery, in our own grief? How many times do we waller and curse God for not understanding the pain that I'm going through? The only way that Ezekiel was going to be able to escape the grief in his life was by telling it what God had said. And the same is for you this morning. If we cannot tell our situation to move on, if we cannot rely on God to revive our souls, then we will never be able to escape the grief that follows behind us. So what does Ezekiel have have to do? He has to do what God commanded him to do. So let's read verses 7 through 14 real quick. I say this, so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, and they may live. So I prophesied as, I, as he commanded me. And breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Can you imagine what is going through the mind of Ezekiel in verse 7. He starts saying everything that God has told him to say. He starts prophesying to these dry, lifeless bones, and all of a sudden, everything changes. The ground starts rattling. or The bones start rattling. The ground starts shaking. A noise echoes its roar throughout the valley. And life begins to form. And once you start speaking to your grief, to your problems, what the Lord is saying, something will happen. Those dry bones will begin to rattle. The foundations of your troubles will be shaking. And life will begin to form. You just have to hold on. Just hold on. These bodies, they started coming together piece by piece, and they rose to their feet, but there was still no life in them. There was still no life in them. And that picture can represent us in here this morning. You can be together. You can be up and walking around, but you can be living in death. You can literally be a dead man walking, breathing in death. You can see, you can smell, you can taste, you can touch, you can hear. You can do all these things, but still be walking around with absolutely no life inside of you. Dwelling in death. But watch what happens next in verses 9 and 10. It says, also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. And 10 says, so I prophesied as he commanded me. 
and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. And breath translated uh, in the Hebrew, uh, it can also mean his spirit. So his life, his spirit, his breath entered into these people. And those bones wouldn't have been able to live again if it wasn't for the spirit of God entering their lives and making them whole. Did you catch that? What does it say in verse 9? It says, also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy to the son of man and say to the breath, thus says Ezekiel. No. Thus says Ryan. Thus says the, the church, the congregation. No, none of that fits. It says, thus says the Lord God. There it is again. And once again, I want to remind us that we can't do this by ourselves. Ezekiel couldn't make those bones come to life with his words. No, they had to come from God and God alone. And if you can't allow God to be the voice in your life, you will never get to experience freedom. Death will always reign as king, and grief will always be your companion. And it has been so long since some of us in here have tasted life have tasted the goodness of this life because we have been stuck in our grief. We have been stuck in our shame and God is wanting to speak life into you this morning and fill your lungs with his breath. But too many of us have been clutching this death because it's all we know. And you might be thinking, Ryan, you don't know my pain. You don't know my struggle. You don't you don't know the things that I have faced in this life. And I may not have faced everything that you have. I may not have experienced the same struggles that you have. And we may not connect on some things. But in essence, it doesn't matter if I have. Because God can handle all of it. God is the one that can handle all your brokenness, all your hurt, all the grief that you have experienced in this life. What are you holding on to? What is keeping us from experiencing freedom? What are we holding on to? Is it our pain? Is it our pride? Is it our doubt? Whatever it is, God is telling you to speak life into that this morning and be changed. This transformation that Ezekiel is experiencing is so much like the gospel. They are so similar. We are caught in sin, and that leaves us lifeless in the valley. We are these dry bones. We are these broken people, and we have been separated from God in this valley because of those sins that we commit, and we are dead. Ephesians chapter 2 says we are dead in our trespasses and our sins against God. But this man named Jesus, he comes along. He was perfect. He didn't sin. He lived a life that you and I couldn't live. And he was, he was God's son. And he came and listened to what God was telling him in his life. He listened to the words and the direction that God had on his life. And he died on the cross as a sacrifice in our place. He took the death that you and I deserved so that we could be redeemed from him. And when he died, when he took on those sins... After spending three days in the grave, God brought him back to life. And because of that, we can trust that God will do the same for us. God can bring you out of the valley this morning. God can bring you back to life today. There's nothing more to hold on to. There is hope for you today. The grief that is in your life will diminish at the word of God. And this morning, you are one of two people in this passage. You might be like Ezekiel. You have been saved. You've been following the Lord. But ask yourself this morning, am I being obedient to what God is saying in my own life? Am I being obedient to the, the tugs that God is pulling you to in your life? To the opportunities, to the moments 
And if, you have, if you're having a hard time being able to answer that, you can come and make it right this morning. Or you could be the bones in this passage. You haven't been saved. You're dry. You're lifeless and broken because of what the world has done to you. But God wants to give you His breath right now. He wants to make you alive again. And the only way He can do that is if you come to Him. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all together. You just have to come this morning. There is no time to wait. Ezekiel did what God wanted him to do in his life, and because of that, he could escape the grief that had been following him for so long. And all these stories that we hear of Scripture, all these passages that we read, they may sound the same, they may, they may come off as the same thing, but the Word of God has one mission, and that is the Gospel. Every passage, every instance we have to look at and ask ourselves, where is Jesus Christ trying to take us in this moment? How does this apply to my life right now? And this morning, some of you are dealing with stuff that is heavier than you, that is too big for you to handle on your own. And God has laid it out in his scripture that we must come to him, that we must be obedient in those times of difficulty and tragedy and rely on him and his strength. And he will handle it. Too many of us in here are playing church. We're just pew packers sitting here holding on to this religious Christianity when God is telling you, I have so much more for your life if you would just listen. As we prepare to head into our invitation and our music ministers make their way up, I want to leave you, I want to leave you with this story. One day, a small town on the beach was preparing for a hurricane. And this hurricane was coming straight for them, and it was, a, it was a strong one. And as the hurricane was making its way closer, the town was evacuating, and the police were doing their rounds to make sure everyone was getting out safely, and everyone was gone. But one, one police officer, he was driving by a beach house, and he noticed that someone was on the balcony. And he, he pulled over, and he stopped and got out of his car, and he told the man, Sir, you can't be here. There is a hurricane coming, and we need to evacuate everyone. And the man on the balcony lifted up his drink in his hand and replied, Officer, we're having a hurricane party. We'll be all right. You should join us. The officer this time he was pleading, he was begging for that man and his friends to come and evacuate because if they didn't, there would be nothing left. And the guy on the balcony lifted his drink again to the officer and went back inside to party with his friends. And the officer had left, he got into his car and he pulled off and finished his rounds and made sure everyone was evacuating out of the city. And a couple days later, after, her, after the hurricane had passed and everyone was returning, the officer, he went back to that spot and he pulled up. And once he got there, there was nothing. There was no house. There were no bodies found. It was leveled. No one had made it through the storm. And this morning, God is pleading that you let him take the grief in your life and come to him for salvation. Because ultimately, just like those guys who stayed, if we stay where we are in sin, we will not make it. But you have to take that offer. If there is anything that you need to let go of this morning to find life, I beg you, I plead, please come 
and lay it at His feet. There is no reason that we should be dead this morning when God is offering us life. There is so much more than what we're taking. Grief will hold us back and keep us captive if we don't let go of it. And time is running out. So come to the altar and let God take control. Pray with me this morning. Father God, Lord, I just pray that you move across this place, God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that if anyone is holding on to the things of this life that are hindering them, Lord, that they let it go. That they come to the altar and lay it at your feet. God, some of us are trapped in death this morning. We are holding on to the grief in our life and it is keeping us captive, but we can't let it go because that's all we know. God, move in our hearts and draw us to you and show us that there is a life that is worth living this morning. Lord, I just, I am so thankful for all that you've done, God. I pray, Lord, that you move across this place. Lord, we invite you in and do what you do best. Lord, and if, and if there was any word that I said that was outside of your will, I pray, the word that you just blow it away like the dust. I'm so thankful for you, God. And I pray that you move. In your name I pray. Amen. If you have business to do this morning, I pray and I beg you to come to the altar. So if you would, please stand. The altar's open. Respond as you feel led as we sing, just as I am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to so glad that everyone is 
made it out. I hope y'all are enjoying the series so far. Next week will be um, God will be studying the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her encounters as she uh, went through that difficult time in her life. Um, at this time, I would like to recognize the 10U boys baseball team. Um, they won yesterday, and they've been doing good. Um, announcements before we close. Um, the back-to-school drive will be July 28th. That'll be from 8 to noon. Um, there's a list of school supplies that we're still needing, and if you would pick one up on your way out, um, and please try and get those to us the Wednesday before um, the actual event. There's a box out in the vestibule um, that you can drop those school supplies off. Um, clothes you can also bring by, and we will put them in one of two places. Um, we just really would appreciate your donations or anything that you could help out with. Um, any other announcements? Uh, I'm not good with remembering. Um, yeah, we are feeding the Lake family after the funeral tomorrow. Um, so if you are bringing a covered dish, please bring it by 12 o'clock. Um, that'd be greatly appreciated. It and uh, we can let them know how much we love them as a church family. Yes, sir, Mr. Harry. Fifth Sunday Sing is coming up, and there are sign-up sheets in the choir room, and there's one out there on the vestibule. Please sign up. Um, please use the gifts and talents that God has given you, and um, it's, it's a fun time, so uh, just please sign up for that. Next week is our monthly church business meetings at uh, 5 o'clock is church council, 6 o'clock is church conference. Uh, because of that, choir practice is going to be at 4 o'clock next week. I know we have a few who are deacons as well and will be at the deacons meeting, but we will still have choir practice next week, Sunday at 4 o'clock. We're kicking things back in, and if you've been praying about it or thinking about it or maybe you haven't thought about it, this is the first time you've thought about it, come join us. We'd love to have you. It's a great time. It's a lot of fun. Uh, be back there next Sunday at 4 o'clock. Amen. Anything else? Any other announcements before we dismiss? Yes, ma'am. So August 4th, um, <laughs> the women's ministry is feeding um, all Brantley County's school staff and faculty. Um, do you, you'll probably need some help. <laughs> uh, so... If you feel like helping that day, we encourage it. We would love to have you. Um, it's always a good time feeding the, the faculty and the ones that are um, the godly influences in our school system. We are so blessed to have all of them. If I drive up, do I get to eat too? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's an Indian. I have to be at work that morning, so I probably good. won't make it. <laughs> Any other announcements before it gets hostile? Um, all righty then. I'm going to pray and then we can be dismissed. Well, so let's pray together. Father God, Lord, I just thank you for um, all that you've done this morning. Lord, I just thank you for the fellowship that you have allowed us to have, God. Um, the time where we can come together as a family, Lord, and just laugh and have fun together, God. I just pray, Lord, that you just uh, bless this church family, God. Give us your direction and your power um, in the coming months, Lord, so that we can, so that we can just move the direction that you want us to move, God. Lord, I am so thankful for this church family and what they mean to me, God. And I know, Lord, that they are just so loving. And um, Lord, I just pray that we just rely on you in the coming months to do your will. Lord, I'm just so thankful for each person in here. I pray that you bless them and bring us back safely. In your name, I pray. Amen.